Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. All right, hey everybody, welcome to episode 347 of the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation. I'm your host, Anthony Renner. The show notes are located at my site, continuefit.com. You can check it out also at shrinkcoachpodcast.com. All right, today on the shrinkcoach.com and mbsc.tv Coach's Corner, spoke with Coach Boyle about some of the different air bike workouts he's been doing and pretty much the why behind them and if he's using them with his clients as well. We've been talking a lot about zone two and he had asked a question about zone two building mitochondria got a lot of responses from that so i wanted to see what he learned from that also a post that he did on picking up heavy dumbbells that really caused the whole shit storm on on twitter or on him so wanted to see what he learned from that now don't forget we also did a special interview for the 15 year anniversary called 40 years 40 mistakes you can access that through strengthcoachpodcast.com or continuefit.com it'll take you uh you just got to give me you know sign up for the strength coach podcast newsletter and you'll get access to that all right for today for the hit the gym with the strength coach segment brought to you by athletic greens athletic greens is 75 high quality vitamins minerals whole food source superfoods probiotics and adaptogens, you can get free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash strength coach. All right, today I have on Danny Foley. He's the co-founder of Rude Rock Strength and Conditioning. He's also the creator of the Fascia Chronicles. I talked to him about his lecture at MBSC, which was building an optimal training program. Some of the quotes in there, like generalize when you can, specialize when you must. Talk to him about some of the, how he's using time blocks. So he gives us an overview and some of the obstacles with that. His quote, the how is more important than the what. Talk to him about what really the strength coach needs to know about fascia because we've been down this road before and he has reopened it with the fascia chronicles. He's done a lot of research and done a lot of work with Thomas Meyer. So uh, this Fascia Chronicles is a is a course that he put out and we're going to talk all about that and really understanding the problem with some of the cadaver research and training connective tissue resiliency, what he means by that. And just really putting all of this together. Good stuff from Danny, really smart guy. For the Kiss Marketing Business Secrets for Gym Owners, Vince Gabriel will go over how to market locally in the post COVID era. Kiss Marketing is a digital marketing agency that helps fitness business owners make the big bucks from their marketing without feeling stupid trust or wasting valuable time figuring out on their own. If you need some help with your marketing, head over to kissmarketing.net to book a free coaching call with Will Matheson, Vince Gabriel's secret marketing weapon. For the getting started with VBT or velocity-based training segment brought to you by Perch, Perch is a 3D camera-based weight room technology solution bringing VBT into the 21st century. This week, Nika speaks about other pieces of weight room technology. He's going to kind of compare the data and the metrics to get what you get with Perch. So today he's going to talk about some jump mats, force plates, and other VBT devices. All right, we got a new segment. The Nomly Maximizing the Member Experience with Sumi Seth. Sumi is the co-founder of Nomly, and we did an interview a couple episodes back that you really want to check out. We went on a whole overview of uh, what Nomly does, and really what the member experience is, and I really wanted him to kind of come on and start to do this. And he, this is a really great uh, segment. He he tells a story today, and really, I'm not I'm not gonna get, spoil it, but he he's gonna demystify the concept of the member experience. That's his goal, and uh, you know, you listen, your members have a certain perception of the experience, and he's gonna talk about how we can understand them on a deeper level. Great stuff from. See me coming up in a bit. All right, perform better right now, guys. Holiday sale, it's huge, up to 40% off. They got so much stuff on racks, benches, bands, sandbags, cleaning supplies, you name it. Check it out, performbetter.com, 40% off. Guys, listen, also, the one-day seminars are back now. 
Uh, they're starting in January. They're going to be in New Jersey, Austin, LA, Chicago, and Boston. And I'm pretty excited. That was something that, you know, they obviously had to kind of postpone for a little bit, but they are back. Check it all out at performbetter.com. Lots of things to get to. So let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the strengthcoach.com and mbsc.tv Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. You can try the new strengthcoach.com out for seven days for free. Totally new format, user-friendly, same great forum as always. It's the place where top coaches in the industry come to connect and learn seven days for free. Check it out at strengthcoach.com. Don't forget to did an interview with Coach Boyle about uh, it's the anniversary edition. We celebrated 15 years uh, doing the podcast on November 2nd, and I posted that interview. you got to get access to that. I have a link at strengthcoachpodcast.com. We talked about his article, 40 Mistakes, 40 Years. Coach, how you doing? I'm doing great, Ian. How are you? All right, all right. You know, I'll tell you what, boy, some of these <laughs> uh, things that you're posting on Twitter – for whatever reason, the last like two weeks or whatever, I mean, you can make a full time job out of this with uh, some of and we're going to get to that zone, too. And then the picking up heavy dumbbells, which got you in a lot of trouble. Coach, you have you did a, a zone five day with Joe Skiz at your at MBSC. And then I know Vinny posted about doing 150 and 25 calorie day. I want to talk to you about why you would do those. I don't know if you're just doing it for yourself or would you program a zone five day? There's four times where you're getting to max. First of all, I want to know what the rest was in between that. And and again, why are you doing these? Do it. Come on. That, let, let's <laughs> go through. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is self-interest. Um, no, I, I do it once a week because it's kind of like you go back to that Andy Galpin thing on the human podcast, right? You know, once a week, you want to kind of blow it up a little bit. In truth, I mean, I was actually a little uncomfortable yesterday for a couple hours afterwards. Oh, wow. <laughs> My heart rate did not want to come down. And uh, I guess I agree with Andy on that point that let's get one really hard one in a week. And so that was the really hard one. And we've just been playing around. It's sort of like pick them out of a hat. You know, I think the first day, it was, you know, Joe got to pick and then I got to pick and then Joe got to pick. And then, so we've done four and then Vinny yesterday decided to jump in. I think he's probably regretting that he got on that train because now he has to stay on. So uh, that makes it harder. And he's, he's not a big guy. So he's a little lighter than me, kind of, you know, the smaller engine. Joe's a big guy. So it's a little bit easier for him. And the, you know, the bike is one of those things. It's like the reverse of running in terms of the, the little, Lighter people are much better when you do running stuff, but you get Joe's pretty fit. You get a big guy like him on the bike and he can really crank it out. Whereas Vinny's probably only, I'm going to guess he's 160 pounds, maybe. So a little less motor. And uh, I mean, it's, it was hard. So basically the rest, we go back to 120 for me. And that ends up being Vinny's heart rate actually matches mine, which is interesting. Whereas Joe is basically 10 beats ahead of me. So Joe, We'll probably, you know, if I get to 170, Joe gets to 180. And then Joe goes back down to 130. And uh, I go down to 120. And Why not Why not 105? Or- I, you know, this was all my, my theory in the beginning when I very first started doing this. People said was that if you stayed 60% and up, then you were getting an aerobic benefit from your interval training. So that we would get, so theoretically for us, we got 20 minutes in the aerobic range, although we did all anaerobic work. So that was always the theory. And who knows? That's one of the things that with all of this. It, it's uh, actually Brett Welsh came on and, uh, and posted on strengthcoach.com. And he's great. I was so glad that he's back on the site because he gives you a really intelligent physiologist's take on all this stuff. And he said, it was like zone two is just, the pure aerobic stuff that we used to talk about years ago. But I think now, and particularly the cyclists, I think have really started to dial into these, to these zones and figure out, okay, exactly where do they want to be? And 
his thing was that you now you kind of get back like if you combine Andy Galpin with the zone two thing, what do you get? Well, you get the Charlie Francis high low idea, <laughs> and and it's just a question of how low are your lows? And so for me, I'm assuming that my low is in that 70% range, not in the 60. Like it would be really 60. I, I, I feel like I wouldn't even turn the pedals after a while if I tried to stay at 120. But when I try to stay, like I get, I can drop right in around 130, 132. And if I stay focused, I can stay right there. But one of the things we talk about, we'll start talking to each other and then we'll realize, oh, crap, I'm at 134 and Joe's at 145. You know, and it's like, okay, sh- let it slide back down again. Uh, the good thing, and we had talked about this in the staff meeting yesterday, and I probably did, I probably butchered physiology yesterday to the point where people might cancel their MBSC TV memberships. But it does get us talking about this as a staff. And the biggest thing for me is I'm very representative probably of our adult male client. And the interesting thing for me is that in spite of everything that I've done from an activity standpoint, I have early stage heart disease. And so you start seeing that that's probably going to happen and probably has already happened to a lot of our clients. Like if they were to go in and get the kind of workup that I got, they're going to realize that maybe there are two or three on that five scale of uh, what I have to. So ASCVD, arthrosclerotic cardiovascular disease is what. Peter to a tier refers to it as, you know, so all of a sudden I've, I'm becoming like a, a general fitness guy and I'm list, reading or listening to human and I'm listening to Peter Atia, but that's the stuff that applies more to me. Obviously I'm still doing, you know, listening to stuff on the athlete side, but I do think for our adult clients trying to get them, you know, we talked yesterday, the whole bucket idea. Okay. What are they lacking? Are they, are we getting, we have some people that are lacking cardiovascular work altogether. We have some people who, when they get to the end of the lift, they leave. We have other people who maybe go and do whatever bike workout we have written up for them for that day. And and then we have some other people who are probably much more into their cardiovascular work who run on off days. And we have some people who run to the gym. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of different types in there. And we're trying to figure out how to manage all those types in a, in a positive way. Absolutely. Uh, let's kind of segue that into another Twitter post, which was, why does zone, you asked, why does zone two work build mitochondria? Can mitochondria not increase in a lactic environment? So, you know, why are you asking this question? And, and really, it was such a long and it was all over the map because people were answering other uh, other replies and it's really hard to follow. What did you learn from that? For me, I, I'm just trying to understand the science of it more. I really am because I think initially um, people were saying that like with the zone two work, you could drift in and out of zone two. And then other people said, no, if you really want to build mitochondria and build that that whatever energy component of the muscle you can't be creating you know and again is it lactate lactic acid it's so like i mean honestly i I feel so um dumb i guess is a good word (laughs) you you know what i mean i don't really the the physiology one it's hard and two it changes all the time but the basic idea is that if you are producing lactate then you probably are discouraging mitochondrial growth. You might be encouraging something else. And that's what's kind of interesting in it from a, you know, we've had like the, the kind of Joel Jameson, we've had the stuff, you know, um, people talking you know, Charlie and those guys talking about, you know, eccentric hypertrophy versus concentric hypertrophy of the heart. Now we have people talking about mitochondria in the muscle. It, it, I'm just trying to, to learn. And I'm hoping, honestly, I'm hoping I can find like the, the, you know, the Mike Boyle of cardiovascular work, who's going to be able to make it simple so that somebody like me, who's not, again, and Brandon Marcello always makes fun because, yeah, I know what you're going to say. It was 45 years ago when you took that class, but it's true. As much as Brandon likes to make fun of me, it's, I'm trying to backfill knowledge that I have not probably accessed in 
decade. No, not probably. Definitely have an access in decades. I always say, you know, there's nobody, there's not a whole lot of strength coaches who can explain Krebs cycle. Yeah. And I don't think there's a lot of strength coaches. And we were always very simplistic in terms of, I love, and I hate to say his name, the, uh, the, the Vern line, as much as I hate to give Vern any credit, but Vern always would talk kind of about just specific energy system development. Look at the game, mimic the game. And we were that way. I mean, we were still that way, right? In terms of we look at it and say, okay, how does the game proceed? What, you know, what does substitution look like? Okay, that's for us, that's kind of what conditioning is going to look like. And we don't really need to understand the physiology. I always go back to the car analogy, right? I don't really need, like if you said to me, Mike, explain internal combustion engines to me. I'd be like, uh, you put gas in it and you start it and somehow it runs. But I, I'm fine driving a car. I manage my car really well without a, a lot of understanding of the inner workings of the vehicle. And I think that's a lot of how we approach the body to some degree. And now maybe we're seeing, particularly in the in this older population, that there's some of the physiological stuff that may matter more than we thought. That's that's the point that I'm getting to. Yeah. I, and by the way, when you talk about finding that Mike Boyle, that piece of it, this is where the Andy Galpin stuff resonated with me when he just said, listen, all right, bottom line, let's get you max once a week. Let's get you somewhere in the middle, maybe one or two times a week. Let's get, let's keep it low. Uh, yeah. You know, a bunch of times. So for me, all the walking, the rucking, the dog walk stuff, that's all my low stuff I'm doing every day and get 12,000 steps. But then I realized, wait, all right, so maybe I do some intervals here and there. But now I want to make sure I get max once a week. And then where am I falling in that middle? Not zone two, by the way, the middle, the one high 140s for me, you know, right. low 150s. And I look at it and think it may be the opposite for us in terms of. Uh, you know, one of the things somebody in the thread said, the bottom line with this most of the time is that our highs aren't high enough and our lows aren't low enough. And I, I probably should write that down because I think that's one of the things that, that came out of it for me. So I think what happens is some people on that high day, they don't max it out. They don't really like the other day when we did, we did basically four times four minutes, you know, which is an old, like a soccer profile. And we did really four times a mile and a half. So it was like three minutes, 50 seconds, somewhere in there. But I mean, I literally, I saw like I was 181. It's like, okay, that's the highest heart rate I've seen in a really long time. So, and I was kind of like, oh, maybe, maybe I don't need to do that. But I don't know if people get close enough to where they really, where that high end point is. And then the lows are not low enough in terms of, I think a lot of people, like for me, I probably spent too much time in that 140, 160 range. So I spent a lot of my riding time would be just in the middle. And then my, my easy, you know, almost my neat activities like that are too low. The, the walks are too low because I don't rock. And I don't love, you know, people are like, oh, what about, you know, uphill treadmill? I'm kind of like, uphill treadmill sucks. You know what I mean? It's one of those things that just, and that's the bad part about a lot of this. And then you get into, I used to always kind of look at, you know, all, everybody would always repost that embrace the suck thing. And I was like, oh, really, I don't understand embrace the suck. What, what does that really mean? And now I think in zone two, I think I'm starting to understand that, like embrace the suck. Like this just sucks. This is, you're on there and you're thinking it's not hard. It's mentally hard because I have to focus all the time on not like getting my heart rate too high. And I literally am embracing the suck. I am like, okay, this sucks, but I'm going to play with this for a while. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to get my blood work done and see what happens. I already know I've seen my, my resting heart rate is the lowest it's been in a while. My exercise heart rate, and I think I said this in the last podcast, highest it's been in a while. I'm looking, you know, I've got one of those eight sleep mattress covers. So I'm looking at that. My sleep is clearly getting better. So the, the next kind of acid test will be, all right, what does my blood work look like? Particularly triglycerides and glucose. Those are the ones I'm going to look at because I'm taking a statin now. So my cholesterol and that stuff is going down anyway. And that's artificial and that's probably related more to the drugs. But I, the interesting thing is statins don't change triglycerides and statins don't change 
blood glucose. So I, I, I do have, I, I probably, cause I keep everything. I probably have seven or eight comparisons that I can make over the last six, seven, eight years and be able to look at that. Can you, do you feel like in, in, from what you've read or heard is some of this stuff reversible? Like, okay, when yeah. you stop smoking, but is the hard stuff, what you're kind of feeling like you're heading towards, is that reversible with some of this stuff? I don't know if the placking is actually reversible. I'm not sure if I can get to a point where I, you know, but even in my case, if I can stop at a two, because a two is like, eh, yeah. you know, you got to do more work. But what you realize, it was funny. Sue has one of our coaches said, would you want to have a cardiologist? Come in? I have a friend who's a cardiologist. And I'm like, no, most of them don't know any, like, I feel like, you know, they're like, oh, I do 150 minutes. Like they don't. Yeah. Like a, the average cardiologist isn't dialed into this the way some of these cyclists, that's where a guy like Atia, because he's a little bit OCD about exercise, he's really dialed into it. The guy that he inter- interviewed that, and he goes on Milan, you know, he's doing cancer research, but comes from a cycling background, was a, like a, was a professional cyclist, really dialed into it. You need to find these people who are in pretty deep to get the real information, the better quality information. I think otherwise you just get a lot of kind of yeah. generic slop. Yeah, these guys are in pretty deep. And even that's why I kind of, I, you know, I know maybe some people get mad at Huberman for certain suggestions, but he's still, he's exercising, he's doing things. He's like a Tia, they're doing this stuff. And they're also speaking to some of the best top people in the world. Yeah, and they're doing really great work. I don't understand because I see that a lot of times people get very, kind of angry with Huberman about stuff. And I'm thinking, you know, here's a guy who's become really, really popular talking about really, really important stuff, interviewing really, really good people. I, I just, I don't get what the, what the beef is. You know, you kind yeah. of, like, hey, what do you, what are you mad about? Yeah, I, and I think for a lot of people, well, they're mad because he's become really popular and really influential. And, you know, and then if he says something that's, not right. Everybody gets all over him. But the bottom line is that he's like a neuroscientist. He's not a, yeah. he's not a health coach. He's not a exercise physiologist. He's not a medical doctor. He's a, a neuroscientist. He might be a medical doctor. Actually, I'm not sure, but, but his, you know, his, his area of study is clearly yeah. not in this area. He is a super intelligent hobbyist, really. Who's interviewing all of these really interesting people and trying it? He's trying everything, you yeah, know. That I, he's- yep. And some of it, I do think some of it's you know bullshit. Like I listened to one that was about like cooling your hands and that that was gonna you know make you do twice as many dips. And I'm like, I, I don't, I don't believe that for a second. I do think there's some of it. I think sometimes he can get bullshitted because he doesn't. He may not, you know, he, his bullshit detector may not pick up all the time on on some of these things, but. Or it seems like it's always like, oh, it's coming from a scientist. So, and they did yeah. this so this study yeah. or, you know, whatever. Exactly. Um, and this, you know, these guys at Stanford said, you know, and you've got guys like, you know, on the sidelines at NFL games wearing like cooling gloves. And I don't know. One thing I've realized is nothing, there's nothing so powerful that it makes a really big difference. Because <laughs> if there was, it would, the popularity would be massive. When people say, oh, this is how you get strong or this is how you get fast. There's, there is no shortcut. I, 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 you know me, I'm very fond of the, the secret is there is no secret saying yeah. because whenever anybody says to me, oh, it's going to change it by 10%. I'm like, no, it's not. Do you have any idea what 10% is? And that's why I like my, my biking stupidity. I say to people, okay, if you think 10%, so if I do a two mile ride and that takes five minutes, that's 300 seconds. 10% is 30 seconds. I have trouble getting 1%. Yeah. You know what I mean? Literally, if I break, if I was to break my best time by 1%, that would be a massive breakthrough. Yeah. Because yeah. that would be three seconds off my best time. Usually for me, I tend to come in about one second, you know, on one side or the other of, of where I have been historically before. So now you're yeah. into now you're bid to 0.033, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really quick before I move on, I did Google. Can you reverse the plaque buildup in the heart? 
Uh, this guy from Harvard, Christopher, Dr. Christopher Cannon, says the key is lowering LDL and making lifestyle changes, blah, blah, blah. Making plaque disappear is not possible, but we can shrink and stabilize it. So I guess that's, uh, you know, hey, better than nothing. But, uh, <laughs> Coach, let's finish up on the shit show that you caused. <laughs> Iki, you posted a picture of disc pressures and just different positions uh, of people like lying down on their back or on their side or standing up or see the see one that, you know, the, the worst one was in a seated position, picking up dumbbells. And you wrote sneaky back pain cause picking up heavy dumbbells to dumbbell bench or dumbbell incline. Many people with back pain don't Think about the effect that picking up dumbbells can have on the discs. If I have a client with back pain, I tell them to avoid heavy dumbbells. Now, to me, this wasn't that big of a deal. Okay, you know, hey, this is a nice recommendation. What did, like, was it semantics? What, what was it that made yeah, everybody so angry? Cool. I think one, semantics. Two, it pisses off the same crowd. I piss off the same crowd all the time. And it's almost always the young DPT crowd, and they almost always come at me with the, <clears throat> you know, you're a fear monger, you're making people afraid to lift weights, you're sending negative messages. And it's like, no, I'm not doing any of those things. I'm just saying if your back hurts, picking up heavy dumbbells off the floor may not be the best idea, right? And then, you know, somebody spent a huge time on causes versus factors and sent me articles on like, you know, it's, it may be a factor, it's not a cause. And I was like, God, I mean, that's semantics, okay? I literally had to look up cause versus factor. Like, you know, it may, and you get into like, well, that may factor into it, but it doesn't cause it. It's not the cause of your back pain. And I'm like, it is the cause of your back pain. If your back didn't hurt, and then you picked up the dumbbells and it hurts, it was the cause of your back pain, at least on that day. And then people, yeah. like, oh, you know, it could be social, emotional, you know, you've got to look at and that's whenever they get into whenever people start saying that, you know, well, you got to think about the social emotional effect of back pain. I'm like, stop, please stop. I get it. Most people who are exercising do not have back pain for social emotional reasons. They have back pain because they're doing something wrong in their workouts. I get it that there are people out there who are manifesting all kinds of different pain syndromes that are uh, that have a psychological component. But it's not what we're talking about here. And it's not a part of the conversation that we're trying to have. So it's, I think it's a combination, like you said, it's, it's semantics. It's a general dislike for me because I say things like orthopedic cost or, you know, the guy was like, oh my God, nice 1980s picture. And, I'm, and I said, well, has that research changed? Do, are you saying that disc pressures are not like they are in the picture? And he's like, no, but that's a really old picture. I'm like, that doesn't matter. Show me data that says that the worst position at, from a disc pressure standpoint is not seated flex trying to pick up dumbbells. Then there was, you know, another guy showing like he literally posted his Jefferson curls and his zerchers from the floor. And it was like, and that was why I don't know if you noticed that like, we posted an article, a strengthcoach.com article. I wrote a response article about it because somebody posted an article that was actually pretty good about flexing or not flexing. But the bottom line at the end of the article, they said, we've got no data to support lifting and flexion at all. Not one study that says it's good. I'm like, okay, that's another one. And they get into the sort of, I mean, this is another one of my favorites. Well, all that research was done on pig spines. And I said the same wise ass answer that I have for everybody is that, yeah, the, you know, there wasn't a big line for the blow up your disc study. You know what I mean? They're like, you know, it's like, so it's really stupid when people say this. And then I get mad because it's the, well, McGill's research, you know, was all, you know, you pig spines. And it's like, how much research have you done? Yes, McGill, they researched pig spines because that's the closest spinal structure they've been able to analyze that, that resembles somewhat the human spine. And they don't get human spines. You know what I mean? It's just, so there's just, there's a million I think problems with the objections and my thing is like, Hey, really, let's just try to be adult about it and try to look at this thing and say, okay, am I arguing about this just because I really don't like Mike Boyle <laughs> or, or am I arguing about this? And, you know, because I really truly believe, and there are, we had a guy the other day doing 
he was started doing Jefferson curls at the gym. And I was like, don't do that, please. And he was like, my physical therapist told me to. And I said, get another physical therapist. He said, if that was the recommendation, if someone is telling you that the, the way your back pain will get better is deficit lifting inflection, I, I'm like, I don't think there's a significant amount of evidence for that. And if there is, I would like you to show it to me. And of course, they can't. They show you pictures of them doing it. And then I have my same eight. You can talk to a lot of 50-year-old strength coaches now who thought I was a loser. And they're the ones that are saying, now, man, my back, my hips, you know, I'm, I'm a mess from all the squatting that I did. And I used to talk about Mike Boyle was a pussy and he's soft. And now I realize that I maybe should have been listening versus talking shit about him. <laughs> yeah. And I think and- that was the same with the flexion-based stuff. I think people will that'll bite people in the ass and they'll come back and be like, yeah, I used to do all that, you know, flexion-based lifting. Now my back's not good. So we'll yeah, see. I, I also think people always forget who we're speaking to. You know, when I do stuff now for my stuff, I'm speaking to men in their 50s, right? So I'm not talking about menopause because I'm not talk, talking about women. I'm not trying to, like I did a video on some double vertical jumps, like two jumps in a row. I was like, guys, one thing, we're in our 50s. Don't worry about how much height you get here. We're trying to just work on some speed. I got the Phil Mickelson master celebration height here. I get it. I'm not that. I don't have a great vertical jump. Don't worry about that. But let, let's not discourage you from doing like know who you're speaking to. And I think that's what the guy talks about manifesting, uh, you know, back pain. Those aren't the people that are coming to us anyway. Right. You know what I mean? It's like it's such a small percentage of people that we're even working with. And then those people, then there's we're talking about athletes. We're talking, it's just crazy. They're not. Again, if you look at it, said, is that the Mike Boyle Twitter audience? The Mike Boyle Twitter audience is personal trainers, high yes. school coaches primarily. They're, it's not people thinking I, I have a, a deep seated psychological fear of picking things up off the floor. And I'm following Mike Boyle in order to get information about how to overcome that. No, you're also not a you're not a PT, so they're not coming into you post surgery or you know from the doctor. You know, obviously you're working post surgery with people, but I'm just saying, like, first they're going to a physical therapist. Like that's who, like you said, a lot of these people are physical therapists who are commenting on your stuff. And and I've said I've said this so many times in the last whatever ten years. It's like, talk to me when you're 50. Talk to me when you're 60. You're, you're going to sing a different tune. I will guarantee it that if you know the, the go heavy or go home thing, all that stuff, It because I, you know, I was there. I was that guy. I can remember. I told you the story. The old guys at the, the airport yelling at me for jumping off the loading docks. I would literally depth jump off the loading docks and like land in a half squat, stick my landing, and the guys be like, I'm telling you, don't do it. And I was like, Come on, I gotta freaking squat five hundred pounds next month. You know, and you know, and and granted, I got strong as hell. But I mean, I look now if I think about jumping off a loading dock, I'm like, oh, that my knees would hurt, my back would hurt. There's a lot of things that would hurt, and they probably hurt from doing all the stupid shit that I did when I was young. And and people, I mean, you know, what are they? Experience is wasted on the young. Yeah. And you know what they say, uh, you know, I, I did all these things as a kid. Now I, I wake up, I <laughs> sleeping, coughing, sneezing. That's where I get most of my injuries. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> no, that's what said. Someone was saying it the other day. It was great. It was an Instagram post or something, but they said old age is, is when you can go to sleep healthy and wake up hurt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and literally you get out of bed. You're like, Oh my God, what happened? You know, what happened while I was sleeping? <laughs> exactly. Somebody came in. That's well, I think sometimes my wife gives me a shot, but We'll leave on that note, Coach. Thanks for doing this. Uh, I will speak to you before Thanksgiving, so I won't say Happy Thanksgiving yet, but thanks for doing this, and we'll speak to you next time. Thank you. Welcome to Namli's Maximizing the Member Experience segment. My name is Sumit Seth, and I'm the co-founder of Namli. Today, I want to demystify this concept of member experience and share what it really means through this wonderful story that I read way back when I was in school. So the story goes that there was a king who had a little daughter who falls seriously ill, and the king promises her anything that her heart desires, to which the princess said, If I can have the moon, I will be well again. So the king summons his lord high chamberlain, 
and demands that he gets the moon. The Lord makes a whimsical speech, which ends in him stating that he can't get the moon, for it's twice the size of the palace and about 35,000 miles away and made of copper. The king then calls the royal wizard, followed by the royal mathematician, both of whom don't do any better in satisfying the king's demand. The royal wizard says it's 150,000 miles away, and the mathematician says it's 300,000 miles away, and no one can get the moon. Dejected, the king calls for the court jester, shares his trouble, stating that every time he asked his wise men to get the moon, it got larger and further away, and asks him to just play a sad tune on his lute. The court jester cleverly suggests to the king that why don't we ask the princess about the moon? And then the court jester goes into the little girl's room. Have you brought the moon to me? asks the princess. Not yet, admits the jester, but I will get it for you. He then asks the little girl how big she thinks the moon is and how far away. It's just a little smaller than my thumbnail, for when I hold my thumbnail up at the moon, it just covers it. She adds that the moon is not as high as the big tree outside my window, since it gets caught in the top branches. The court jester says, I will climb the tree tonight when it gets caught in the top branches and bring it to you. And as he was walking out the door, he turned around and asked the little girl, By the way, what is it made of? And she replies, It's made of gold. Of course, silly. The court jester then gets the royal goldsmith to make a tiny round golden moon, just a little smaller than Prince's thumbnail. The court jester takes this moon to the princess, who is overjoyed, the king is happy, and the next day she is well again. The purpose behind sharing this story is that we should act like the court jester and realize that the princess, which represents our members, have a certain perception of the moon, the experience. And if we just take the time to understand and get to know our members better and at a deeper personal level, only then we would be able to fulfill those very desires. For it doesn't matter what we think. What matters is what our members think and feel. And the way to get to know their desires, their need, their goals, is to dig deeper and ask them questions that takes us away from the superficial surface level of needs they share, like I want to lose weight. Some of my favorite tactical questions that you could ask after you get to know your members a little bit better is, what do you want to accomplish? And why is that important? Why does that matter now? And what they like and dislike about their past experiences? Once you know the responses to those questions, you can then customize your whole approach keeping those very questions in mind. That's it for today. My name is Sumit Seth, co-founder of Namli. For more info, please check out namli.com. You can schedule a demo to get a feel for what it's about and how we can help in elevating your member experience. Use the referral code STRENGTHCOACH to get started on a free 30-day trial. Hey guys, welcome to Business Secrets for Gym Owners. This is Vince Gabriel. I have a quick story about uh, ACL injury prevention. I was listening to Eric Cressy talk about how he used to go in and watch shoulder surgeries to get better at the shoulder. And at the time, I was doing stuff with ACL injury prevention. So I called a local, uh, well-known orthopedic surgeon who was doing ACLs. He was a specialty in ACLs. And I asked him, I was like, hey, can I come watch a, a surgery? And he was like, yeah, of course. He invited me into the room and he like showed me everything. And I'm like literally standing there in scrubs right next to him. He's open, holding open a knee and he's like, hey, Vince, come here, look at this. It was pretty crazy. And, you know, after that, we became, you know, uh, colleagues and you know, sharing stuff, you know, back and forth and everything like that. And I randomly asked him, I was like, hey. You know, I want to do a workshop on how to prevent ACL injuries. And I want to know if you'd like to do the medical part. Obviously, I can't do that part. And I would do the prevention part. And he was like, yeah, of course. And um, he was a really, really well-known guy. So the fact that I was putting myself, I mean, I'm like 29 years old at the time, you know, just started 
training, you know, I was training for a while, but it just started my business. And uh, me putting my face on a poster with this very, very well-known doctor was like immediate authority uh, in my community. And uh, the, it was pretty cool because it lasted, I think, almost eight years uh, until this doctor ended up retiring. Um, but we did this seminar together and he would put it out to his network and I put it out to mine. And for eight years in a row, we had probably 100 to 150 people come to my gym and learn about ACL injury prevention. And I had all kinds of clients that were generated from this. And my call to action to you guys listening to this is this. I feel like all this kind of stuff, the local seminars, the local workshops, the going and doing the booth at the 5K, the going in your community and you know making a, a joint, creating joint ventures with other local businesses, COVID kind of threw a wrench in all that for us and rightfully so, right? We couldn't do it. Um, but I feel like a lot of people have not restarted. A lot of people are just still relying on, you know, running Facebook ads, which I'm a fan of and doing email stuff, which I'm a fan of. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of business that you can develop right inside your community. And probably the best way you can do it is with these little workshops. And they don't even have to be big ones. Like I was doing like 100, 150 people. Like you could really benefit from doing a small workshop with 10 qualified people that um, you bring you bring into your gym to teach about fitness and health and everything like that. So it's a really, really powerful way uh, to grow your business, but it's kind of like a, a long lost art. And one of the things I'm doing to try and bring it back is I'm going to be doing a, an upcoming workshop on grassroots marketing, just all about stuff that you can do in your community um, to, 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 to grow your business. And I feel like a lot of people like, oh yeah, I know that I know on instincts on what to do, but, but no one really does it well and successfully. So that's what I'm going to be doing is, you know, doing a a two hour plus workshop over zoom, um, to help you grow your business, uh, through, uh, grassroots stuff. Uh, it'll be fun. So if, the the workshop is technically it's free, but you got to be in my club to do it. And you can join my club um, for a buck. It's called the Marketing Master Insiders Club. And you just got to go to club.vincegabriel.com and sign up for a $1 trial. And you can get access to this grassroots marketing event, plus all the other stuff that I've recorded, you'll get access to as well. Plus, you'll get a monthly newsletter, plus you'll get access to the Facebook group. Uh, plus you'll get access to a password protected thing where you get a whole bunch of other stuff. So join me upcoming. Uh, when you hear this, it should be in a few days. I'm not sure when this is coming out, but uh, for our grassroots marketing masterclass, you can start getting more clients with grassroots marketing. Peace. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Getting Started with BBT or Velocity-Based Training brought to you by Perch. Perch is a 3D camera weight room technology solution bringing BBT into the 21st century. I am Nico Ouellette, and I'm the head of marketing and education for Perch. And in this series on the Strength Coach podcast, we cover all things related to BBT. Today, we're going to dive into some other pieces of weight room technology and compare the data and metrics you get with those to what you can receive from a BBT device. There's a bunch of different types of weight room tech. Uh, today, we're going to talk about jump mats, force plates, and velocity-based training devices. What is the difference in data collected and how can it be used? First and foremost, all data collected is great, but only if you have a use for it in mind. Data for data's sake doesn't necessarily make sense. More than anything else, collecting data over time is what will reveal trends and produce actionable results instead of just one-off testing or using the data or having something flashy just to have something flashy. So let's get right to it. Force plates. Force plates can be used to test myriad metrics and are often used to inform fatigue and readiness for athletes throughout their training seasons. Strength tests include isometric pulls and squat holds, both bilaterally and unilaterally. You can capture rate of force development or RFD. You can see limb asymmetries, peak force outputs, jump testing, so counter movement, drop jumps, single leg jumps, et cetera, and even reactive strength index or RSI, which is ultimately just a measurement of the reactive jump capacity of any athlete. Uh, And the amount of data and metrics force plates can capture is is really pretty all-encompassing. 
but they can be kind of bulky, a little bit expensive, and they're really used like pre or post training, not necessarily within sessions, which is why some folks turn to jump mats for a simpler piece of technology with ultimately kind of simplified metrics. So jump mats. Jump mats are used to measure jump height, mainly using flight time and contact time uh, to extrapolate that data. They're often used as a measure of fatigue and readiness as well, and they can be used to back calculate reactive strength index or that RSI, again, that uh, jump capacity reactivity for an athlete um, with some additional uh, calculations. They're typically a simpler version and typically less expensive as well than force plates. Uh, but like we said, you might not need something super complicated, especially if you're really not sure what to do with the data yet. Again, jump mats are typically seen used pre or post workout. Uh, so they're not necessarily really used within sessions either. VBT devices, we'll get right to it. Velocity-based training devices can be used to measure, you guessed it, uh, fatigue and readiness by some different metrics. And they can also be used within training sessions to help guide load and intensity of a given session. Devices can vary in their metrics that they output, but typically you'll see peak and mean velocity, peak and mean power, time to peak velocity, time to peak power and velocity at 100 milliseconds as well. Um, some other metrics might be eccentric metrics and power or velocity relative to body weight or height. And even jump height with some and a growing number can also capture RSI as well. Ultimately, the biggest benefit of VBT is that it can be used as more than an assessment tool for your post training. It can also be used as a training tool. It cannot currently capture isometric metrics like force plates can. Uh, and there's some other kind of variances in the data that they can collect. But whatever your weight room training technology, the data should be simplified and actionable. So you can better help your athletes and clients improve their performance over time doesn't necessarily matter what you're using as long as you know how to use it, you trust it, and you and your clients can both get the most out of it. That is all for today. Thanks for listening. And if you have any more questions about VBT or want more information and special deals, head to perch.fit slash strength coach. That is perch.fit slash strength coach. Thanks. All right. Hey, everybody. Now it's time for the Hit the Gym of the Strength Coach segment brought to you by Athletic Greens. 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens. I use it every day. For me, it basically just fills in the gaps in my nutrition. Probably use it. Uh, I make sure I, I, I probably around midday, but I'll do it first thing in the morning if uh, I've been drinking the night before. So feel like it helps. Uh, so Athletic Greens is going to actually give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. I highly recommend you get in the subscription because you also get a discount of 20% off and you can cancel or skip at any time. All you got to do, visit athleticgreens.com slash strength coach. All right, today we have on Danny Foley and uh, this is actually a long time coming. I always ask Coach Boyle about different uh, coaches he wants me to interview. And he, he said this a while ago, but it took me a while. But following a six-year stint at Virginia High Performance, where he worked with active duty veteran naval special warfare SEAL personnel, and he's currently a high-performance coach and injury management specialist working with a broad range of athletes. He recently came on as director of performance at APE, APE Fitness and Performance, where he works with athletes ranging from high school to professional levels. He's also the Director of Injury Restoration and Performance at Batchik Methods. Hopefully I pronounced that right. Uh, he's also the co-founder of Rude Rock Strength and Conditioning. And if he wasn't busy enough, he's set to release, or he just released, Fascia Chronicles. And we're going to talk a lot about that today. But uh, that was just released. Danny, thanks for doing this. Anthony, thank you so much for having me, man. I'm really excited to jump on today. All right. Awesome. Well. Like I said, Coach Boyle had asked me, you know, or kind of given me the suggestion a while ago. And then for me, I'm just lazy. And once I saw that you did a a, 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 a lecture at MBSC, that gives me a little bit of, of uh, kind of a base to go off. And we're going to talk about that because you did building the optimal training session. I, I thought it was really good. And, and there was some great stuff in there that, you know, like unique nuggets in there that I want to want you to expand on. and. Um, and then we're going to get into some fascia because like we were talking about earlier is this is a topic. It's not new, obviously. Thomas Meyer has been around for a while. I first got introduced to his work through athletes performance in the, in the early 2000, 2004, 2005, he spoke to perform better, but I really feel like there's, there hasn't been someone to put this stuff together like you did in a couple of your articles. So we're going to get to that, but let's talk about building the optimal training session and, 
Uh, I want to start out with uh, one of the quotes that you had, generalize when you can, specialize when you must. It's a pretty general statement, so expand on it. So, it, you know, everything for me uh, really was was developed through BHP. And, and my time spent at BHP was just really integral for my perspective on movement, performance, and, and you know, kind of now transitioning back into the sports performance side. Uh, I hate the word unique, but it, it kind of gave me, you know, a, a really unique perspective in that even though I'm a strength and conditioning coach, everything that we were doing at BHP was governed through injury, right? And when you're working with the the high level military population, you're gonna you're gonna see a wide range of shit. It it just it's a lot of different things that you really can't prepare for. So, you know, we get a year or two into this bottle working with these athletes and and literally every single one, you know, slap tear, rotator cuff tear, Achilles tear different ligamentous injuries in the knees and the hips, and then having different kind of spinal injuries and head injuries. It, it just quickly, real. we quickly realized like, hey, the regular conventional stuff just isn't going to work, right? Beyond that, we were training men and women two times a day. So where most people have the issue or the limitation of like, oh my God, I only see my athletes for three hours a week. How do I fit all of this stuff into this tiny window? Our problem became we have all these hours to populate. How do we do it in a pragmatic and meaningful way? So that introduced us to, you know, some of this non-conventional or abstract methodology, which then led me into the fascia rabbit hole. So this is about five or six years ago. And, you know, I'm I'm somebody who struggled mightily in undergrad. I was a degenerate and and not very good at the at the academic stuff, you know. So for me, it was like, how can something as is, is incredibly fascinating and vexing as the human body be boring in lectures and in labs? And, and it just never really made sense. It always felt like it was incomplete. So for me, when I really started to kind of grab the, the, the fascist stuff, it, it really started to bridge these gaps together. The anatomy started making more sense. The biomechanics started making more sense. Applications, you know, became a little bit more of a wide spectrum and, and gave us a little bit of a bigger purview to look through. So really, it was it was this culmination of things where I, I tried to do what we were taught to do. It didn't work. I found this this other th set of things that really helped put everything together and make it make sense. And then here we are. So, you know, now coming into this, you know, generalize where you can special or generalize where you can specialize where you must. That was a a a priority for me, you know, kind of speaking to the social media thing where. I recognized that a lot of what I was posting was not things that were going to be conducive in conventional environment. And to be quite honest with you, I, I didn't really get as much pushback or kickback as I thought I would. But I always felt this like responsibility to make sure that I was giving good context to what I was posting and why I was posting it. And what that kind of created for me, kind of looking at it on all spectrums now is there's a time and a place to generalize and there's a time and a place to specialize. And what this industry is going through right now is a tremendous growth in reach. We're seeing specialties, specialists and specialized strength and conditioning for oncology and for autism and for high performance and for military and for general population. And I think that's a great thing. What we have to get past is this archaic or dogmatic philosophy of if you bench, you squat, you dead, and you sprint, you've done your job, and that's it. And I'll be perfectly honest with you, man. This is something that's kind of personal to me because the national average for a strength and conditioning coach in terms of pay is right around $45,000 a year. That's in the same field where our expected work is, is generally beyond 40 hours, sometimes upwards of 55, 60 hours a week. So we can objectively say that we're undervalued, we're underpaid, we're overworked, but then we're also the first ones to just sit back and be like, basics, 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 basics. If you do anything outside of a box squat or, or a deadlift, you're doing too much or, or being too abstract. And I disagree. Be a generalist when you can be a generalist. If you're working with 12 to 16-year-old kids, yeah, push, pull, squat, sprint, hinge, go play, probably going to be enough. If you have a 32-year-old operator who's had two de combat deployments and six musculoskeletal injuries plus four severe head injuries, that basic stuff is not going to work. So we need to understand that there's versatility to this field, and that's okay. It's just a matter of context, time, and place. Totally agree. And you know, right now, my my big thing is working with 50-year-old people over 50. I'm 55, so 
the the one thing that I notice in in you know my almost 20 years of of training all these old I worked with golfers so really the demographic was always older men for the most part 90 percent of them and what I started to realize was we were getting so caught up in so many of these little details of specifics now obviously I'm working with golfers so I'm talking about specifics who I'm you know right I I was trying to be as specific as I could but at the same time, I was like, we need to do a little bit of everything. We're in our 50s because it wasn't only about golf for me. It was more about, hey, we need you know, longevity and, and better movement and quality of life. And for me, having this good general program, kind of checking some of these different boxes, that was just the, like a general, it's not a 32-year-old operator, kind of going back. And I, it's funny because that you just said, yeah, if you're dealing with 14 to 16-year-old, I felt like it was the same thing. Like once we get to that certain age, like we got to go back to that because we lost all of that. We got to restart it. Now it's not for everybody, but I really, I love that idea uh, that you're talking about. It's like, and and it's not just one way. It's, hey, you got to look at the situation that you're in. Um, now we've, what the, God. we've seen plenty of coaches that have had tremendous amounts of success that have done this thing completely differently. And I, and I think that we become victims to our own preferential bias where, you know, we see things that we like or we know have relationships with certain people. So we just kind of latch on to these, these big, you know, figures in our field and we're like, this is the only way to do it. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a little bit lazy, but my philosophy is coming from speaking of our guy, Mike, you know, one of the first things that I heard him say that stuck with me uh, ever since is steal good shit from smart people. I mean, I, I heard that at like 23, 24 years old and it punched me in the face. I'm like, man, that is brilliant. And it's very simple. So I take things from Cressy. I take things from Mike. I take things from, you know, Tom and Gary Gray and some of the more fashion based community. And I just apply what works based on who I'm working with. And I really don't try to overthink it beyond that. Yeah. And I think getting too deeply involved in one way, for example, if you think, Mike's way is the only way, and then you discount the Gary Gray stuff or some of the other stuff, right? Then, then you're going to have a problem because then we start to look at the way somebody's done something, and there's also so many other factors, logistics, and uh, yeah. uh, 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 you know, history or or the lens that Mike and I talk about all the time, the lens that they're looking through. So you got to be careful of just kind of following that person. You got to take something that fits in your system, but in my opinion, uh, I think yeah. sometimes we. Well, and you guys touched on this in the in the forty lessons in forty years, and this is another thing that from from Mike has been very profound for me. Um, and 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 I say this with all due respect for you guys over fifty, but when when men or women over fifty years old that have been doing something for 20, 30, 40 years change their mind on something, it immediately gravitates me towards them because that shows me that you're still in a learning phase. You still have vulnerability, you're still open-minded, and that's somebody that I want to model myself after. So kind of the phrase that I've adopted from that is firm beliefs held loosely. I know exactly what I want to do. I know exactly what the right thing is in this moment, but I'm always inclined or receptive to something better if it presents itself. Absolute firm beliefs held loosely. Yeah, I love that. Now, let's speaking of held loosely, time blocks. Talk to me about, this is really... I want you to give us an overview of how you're programming time blocks and what are the obstacles? What are the problems we're going to run into if I start to say, Danny, I love this idea. I'm, I'm going, I'm using it, but you get, hey, be careful if you use this because talk okay. to us about time block. So time is the ultimate variable um, for all of us and, 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 in, and especially in the coaching field. Um, at the end of the day, people have, schedules and they have commitments and life obligations. So we're going to be relegated, truthfully, a pretty small margin of time throughout the week, right? And so we have 168 hours in a week. If, if we have a standard situation, that's going to be three days a week for one hour with each athlete. So that's three out of 168 athletes. So we can talk all about methods, principles, blah, 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 until we're blue in the face. But if you aren't highly efficient and economical with your time, then what you're doing needs to be worked on. So initially, the time blocks were a way for me to just kind of pace and auto-regulate with my athletes. And this, again, is another thing that goes back to 
my early days at BHP where I didn't really know what I could prescribe in advance, right? I didn't know what the the rate of fatigue was going to be. I didn't know what the tissue tolerance really was for a lot of these injury cases. So I would just apply an arbitrary time block, you know, somewhere around 15 to 20 minutes, and we're going to work through our movement prep, our tissue work, our primary loading and lifting, and then we'll get about 20 minutes of our accessory block, and that would divide the time up. That way, what I could do is I could just elongate or reduce the rest time so that I could control the volume without having to tell them, because that's a really important thing when you're working with the military population, and and this applies also to the athletic population, is you want to be careful about how much you're putting out in front of them before we see the session kind of undertake, right? And I know, you know, just like a simple example of this is, you know, saying something like, hey, we're going to do five sets of five today. And you know, we're on our second, third set, and everything looks awful, the knees starting to flare up, and then I have to kind of regress them back. And then that sets a bad psychology for the athlete and for the session. So I kind of took that away from them. We're going to work sets of five, we'll see, see how many we get, maybe three, maybe five, kind of depending on how we do, we'll fluctuate the rest time based on performance. Then I started getting big into, um, you know, my online coaching and, and building the remote presence. And this was where I really solidified this, uh, this setup or approach. I don't have the ability in a remote setup to be able to see the person on the day of training. I don't know what they did Sunday night. If, if we come in Monday morning, if they're hung over, if they had a rough weekend with the kids, whatever it may be. Um, I also don't know when they're feeling as best as they've ever felt. Right. So my thing is like, Hey, if I'm going to set somebody up and I can't physically assess them every day when we're training. I don't want to give them three sets of 10 if they're feeling, you know, like the best they've ever felt. And then they're like, oh, I only had three sets. And then in the opposite case, five by five, 85 percent, they come in feeling like a bag of shit. I don't want to force them into that. So what the time blocks does is it gives you a base parameter. And what you will do is you will uh, basically auto regulate or fluctuate that rest period so that you can determine the volume based on feel. Honestly, man, it's just a very archaic way of, of auto-regulation and, and kind of controlling training volume and load. But what I have found is, is that it creates a much more comfortable pace to training. And it also changes the perspective a little bit. So this applies whether it's in-person or remote-based. But the goal of training is not to absolutely maximize every single set of every single day and push yourself to the red every single time. You should feel confident with the amount of work that we're doing, both volume and intensity wise. So if we have days where we're feeling better, do a little bit more. When we have days where we're not feeling so great, do a little bit less. And then next day is next day, right? So we got to kind of get away from this, you know, like almost dictatorship of like, hey, the, the sheet says five sets of five. So we need to do five sets of five. I think training is a little bit more altruistic in that, in the sense that you know, it needs to be very much governed by the present moment and less by what these like, you know, kind of structured templates of perfection su- su- suggest or say. Yeah. One thing I, you know, obviously when I was starting to hear this, my question would be because if I, I'm thinking of a couple of my clients, I got my client, Larry, who would be like, you're going to say five sets of five. He's going to, and you, I know you dealt with, he's going to do eight. He's going to do eight, right? Um, So he's going to say, and I did eight today. You believe it? You know, no, I didn't want you to do eight just to do. And then he'll he'll do the same thing the next week and he'll try for nine. So how do you how do you kind of control that? Yeah, well, I'll I'll use the uh, the military guys for this because it's honestly the best example, right? That is the the epitome of more is better. If I'm not vomiting at the end of my workouts, it wasn't effective, you know, that kind of stuff. And and this was, again, it goes back to the word perspective, right? Where this is a culture or a group of individuals who are, are literally, you know, developed through this push yourself until you literally can't stand philosophy. And it becomes pervasive. It, they, they take it, you know, very literally for the training sense. They, they start to take it very literally in every, every other sense of life as well. So I tried to kind of change the the perspective or the the priority of training. And for that population, especially, you are not going to go, you know, do, you know, an hour of legs or or do a a training split and become a better operator. That's not how that works. 
what we're trying to do is we are trying to develop the physical qualities that give you the base or the platform for you to go perform your job at a higher level and presumably for a longer period of time with less constraint or, or less setback. I think it's the same thing in the athletic or the sport performance world, right? We can, again, we can cherry pick athletes from all different eras, all different sports that they did this, they did this. So this has got to be the best way to do it. I don't think that what we do matters as much as how we do it. So there are certain things that definitely need to be present in a sports performance program, but I think a lot of it is really up for interpretation. So with that, I want to make it very clear to the athletes that what we are doing is really just trying to develop your robustness. We're trying to develop your physical capacity, and we're trying to develop the base physical traits that are required for you to develop the skill for your sport of time. And that's critical. So if you miss your your 95% back squat when we're in our heavy strength phase, I honestly don't really care. It, it, it doesn't really show me much. We just didn't hit a number that we tried to project to hit for that day. If we are if we're scheduled to perform at 80% and you feel like that's too light, then let's bump up a little bit. Like we just got to kind of navigate this a little bit more fluently. And I think stop being so zealous to, to again, like these programmatic and predictive models and structures. I think that is really what provides the humanistic element of coaching. And it really is an indirect way that we can create a much deeper rapport with our athletes that we both have a better sense of understanding of what we're embarking on and what we're trying to achieve with this. Yeah, I, I love it's funny because I wrote down about the how is more important than the what when I heard you say that I really like that idea. And, but it kind of tied back and you just mentioned it. It was pursue performance, not PRs. You don't really you basically said you don't really care how much they're lifting. Uh, that could be maybe I want you to expand on that because it, it almost sounded like, hey, we don't care if you get stronger. But because you and you also said later on. Force is part of, but not the whole situation. So just to over, give me an overview or clarify that. Or yeah, expand absolutely. It. So let's get, let's just put context to it, right? So if I'm working with a, a college football team and we're in our off season period, I would expect that more often than not, we should hit those numbers that we're projecting to hit because the, the time frame or that point of the calendar has less variance. There's less unpredictability to it. We have more physical time with our athletes. There, there's not as much compounding stress, and there isn't the priority of the game. If we're on the in-season period, the priority is the game. That is it. Because you can have you know, weight room monsters and people that are hitting PRs every six weeks, but if they can't play, then what does it really matter? right? And then if we take it to a general population sense, I really don't care what those numbers look like. I think, I think that the the increase in, in weight or the increase in PRs or anything like that are just byproducts of good programming and good structure on the coach's side and good compliance and good discipline on the athlete's side. So again, theoretically, if we're within the first year or 18 months of working with somebody, more often than not, we're going to see linear progression. We're going to, because we're going to do what we're supposed to do, things are going to go up, but it's not the priority. The priority is for the athlete, are you getting better at your sport? Are you moving up on the depth chart? Are you performing better in your games? Are you getting the opportunity to play at the next level that you want? On the general population side, are you healthy? Are you happy? How's your stress management? Do you, do you like your physical appearance? Are you dropping body fat, gaining muscle? Those are the things that I really put my time into. So if we see improvements on a, on a back squat, if we see improvements on a deadlift or a split squat, that's fantastic, but it's just a byproduct in my mind of, of good practice and, and good consistency. Love it. And I, I, you know, I think you mentioned it earlier and you mentioned it a lot in the, in the lecture was this idea of autonomy. And yeah. I think the time block is, is a great example of autonomy. It, can you talk about what you mean by athlete reciprocity? Yeah, I treat. So I think about this, uh, I think about coaching a lot uh, in the sense of how tutoring was for me, right? I sucked at, at chemistry. I was awful at every math class I ever took. And I had to go to tutoring a lot because I, I was not getting good grades. So I worked with a lot of different tutors, ones that were presented by the university, private, et cetera, et cetera. 
And I always enjoyed and appreciated the ones that made me do the work the most. And the ones that just took my homework, took my money, did it for me, gave me the, the solution sheet for the test. You could tell that I was just a ticket for them. I was just the next person that came in that they were you know, being paid to help. And I see that a lot in coaching where it's just you're, you're doing a job, right? It, it, you know, we talk about the personal nature to coaching and how it's a lifestyle, blah, blah, blah. I, I think that in theory, those things are, are great. But I think there are very few people who are actually living that out. Most people in this field that I've interacted with just see this as being transactional. I have a job. I'm going to help these athletes. I'm going to get them better. And I'm going to do well at it, but I'm not going to go above and beyond. Above and beyond doesn't just consist of doing more outside of your time of work. It doesn't mean just picking up phone calls or going to a kid's game. It also means treating them very seriously as a part of this process. So I'll give you an example. One thing I recently adjusted and transitioned to uh, somewhat recently was introducing a movement literacy day. Because again, it, it just kind of dawned on me like, you know, within the last year that like most people don't even have a clue what we're really doing trying to do or what we're embarking on, right? And this isn't just task completion or compliance. It's not just me telling people what to do and then being effective at making them do it. I genuinely want people to try to understand the constructs of training, human performance, biology, movement mechanics, all these things on a deeper sense, because I don't want to create myself as being an external pillar of reliance. I want to help them better understand how to do this for themselves. And that's not going to hit 100%, right? There's going to be a good portion of kids that really just don't give a damn about what we're doing. That's fine, right? But I'm not going to, to I'm not going to perturb the 20 to 30 or 40% of kids who are interested in this just because I know there are ones that aren't. So this movement literacy concept, I have my first day that is dedicated to intake and assessment, conventional, just as everybody knows and does on their own. But my second day is now dedicated to movement literacy concepts. And this is literally the entire hour block. And what we do is we're going to go through and we're going to utilize a hybrid strategy of some whiteboard, some demo, some monkey see, monkey do, some discussion, some video review, and essentially introduce different foot mechanics, hip and trunk position, how the shoulder works how to you know, perform a lunge, a crawl, a squat, what I'm looking for in terms of rotation, and just giving them a very basic level of understanding of what we're going to do, what our main movements are going to be, and what our priorities are going to be, so that they can have a clear and upfront understanding of what we're getting ready to get into. This also creates a very genuine and organic uh, structure for Q&A giving them opportunity to bring any priorities to the table from their side of things. And I think, you know, if nothing else, it gives us that humanizing moment of like, hey, man, like I'm here to address what you specifically need. And this is what my expectations are going to be for you. We'll be very clear on both ends up front. So then that way, when we come in on the next session, we hit the ground running and all this is behind us. I got to be honest, it worked extremely well. I, I really enjoyed that adjustment. I, I love it because. I battled with that a lot. Yeah, I like to talk a lot. I like to, I love the idea of educating and and sometimes I I could see certain clients it just wasn't for them. Right? They didn't care. Just give me what just give it to me. I'm I'll do it. And yep. but I'm really proud of a couple of the athletes, young athletes like the hockey player Dante that I had, he, he ended up being the captain at his prep school. And, and he took those kids, he learned what I was doing. He took those kids through workouts at certain times, you know, in off season, same thing with a tennis player I had went to Fairfield university in it because tennis was on the back burner. He led the workouts based off of what really I taught him and what we went through. And I, and I have a pro golfer who's you know on tour and she has to do a lot of stuff on her own. So really proud of that piece of it that I stuck with it and said, no, I really believe in this educational piece. So that's why when you were saying that, it always, it really made me feel like, you know, a connection because I said, you know, some people would just say, don't do that. Just give them what you're, what you're going to do. And it's so lazy, man. And, and again, we have to understand setting in context. So when people talk about educating their athletes, I feel like everybody immediately connotates that to like, having a 12 year old getting drilled down on second level anatomy on a whiteboard. And it's yes. not that at all, it is very much esoteric in that it's 
you know, I've had some cases where we did get into, you know, pretty deep foot anatomy for somebody who was coming off of an Achilles tear and they wanted to know more about the anatomy and structure of the foot. But then I've had other ones where like I've had a 14 year old female um, who just like unprompted asked, asked me a question in the middle of it about, you know, weight cut strategies and what she should do for that. And that's not something I would I would typically build into this movement literacy day. But I'm like, boom, hey, that's what we got to address, because that's what's a priority for her. So we took about 20, 30 minutes and cleared that up and it ended up being very significant for her. So when we say the term educating the athletes, it's just showing them the ropes and it's just prioritizing whatever is important in their world. So if it's again, if it's somebody who is coming off of a severe injury, an ACL injury, we want to give them a rundown on some things that they need to be aware of, giving them a very thorough rundown on what their warm up strategy should be, giving them at home you know, material and things that they can work through, some different resources. And it's, again, just doing your job. You're not there to be a disciplinarian. You're not there to set the tone and make them meet your model. It's your opportunity and your responsibility to figure out how they learn best, who they are, what their priorities are, and then you put the the strategies together from there. Yeah, absolutely. Love it. And I think this is a good segue into this idea about fascia. And uh, when we talk about how deep we maybe need to educate our clients, but also how deep we need to go. And and so I just want to set this up. One of your articles, um, I will post the link. It was emphasizing the fascial system in training. And that is at Rude Rock, uh, RudeRockStrength.com, where a bunch of your articles are. And you had said you, you've been veering further away from the conventional musco, musculoskeletal lens and constructs of Newtonian physics while becoming more invested in the bio integrity fascial approach. Now, that's a ma- mouthful, but the primary point was recognizing the significant limitations to fixed compound bilateral loads, as Bill Parisi tremendously describes throughout his book, we need to give more attention to omniplanar movement, speeds and angles of movement, how these affect the proprioceptive bodies and tissue qualities of fascia. So my question to you is, again, that's a mouthful, but let's get an overview of fascia and really what does the strength coach need to know about fascia because it seems like we went down this a little bit with Bill with uh, Thomas Myers early and it really didn't stick early in in the mid 2000s because I think it was pretty complicated I'm not sure what we were really getting from it it was so um and and then Bill's book came out and kind of taken taken it into more of our language talk to me about give us an overview of the fascia and what we really need to know about fascia yeah, so let's let's start very, very general here. We'll go with the 10,000 foot view and then kind of work our way down. So if we just need a, a simple, pretty definition for fascia with a bow on top, your, your fascial system is a global connective tissue that interconnects all biological structures throughout the body. Now, the fascial tissue itself is highly integrated with sensory bodies. It plays a significant role in in neurology and neural mechanics. It has a significant role in fluid dynamics. And generally speaking, the fascial tissue is working to just balance global tension and compression. Okay. So another quick caveat. Um, We were talking a little bit a second ago about uh, I had the, the tremendous opportunity to go out to Boulder, Colorado last year. Uh, for Thomas Meyer's uh, anatomy di- or fascial dissection course, rather. And let me just be very, very clear in saying this. The fascial tissue is real. It's a real thing. It's tangible. It's palpable. And the reason why there is so much ambiguity and disconnect with the fascial system is this. There is a very incomplete nature to cadaveric research. And I, I know that I might get blamed for saying this on, on such a big channel, but it's important this is addressed. With the embalmment process and the chemicalization process with, with cadaveric research, like we see in our university settings, the tissue is very decrepit, it's dehydrated. 
And the reason for that is, is because they, they draw the blood out and they draw most of the fluid out of the, out of the bodies. And it's, it's replaced with this embalming fluid, which again, kind of denigrates the fascia tissue and it, it just dehydrates the environment. So when you get an opportunity to do a dissection course, like the one at anatomy trains, we started day one and the bodies were fully skinned, right? So the first day or two is actually de-skinning the body and then it works down from there. It was a fascinating course. I absolutely could not recommend that highly enough to anybody in this field. But I had about 50 hours of time in, in undergrad doing cadaveric, you know, dissection work. And in this course throughout the week, we got about 40 or 50 hours. So I've seen both settings and I can tell you definitively it's, a, it's an entirely different experience. But the reason, again, is that, that we don't see more of this in, in common conventional literature is because most of the cadaveric research that we've done has been on embalmed bodies. So it hasn't been present. And this is why fascia had developed this reputation of being a packing, you know, kind of filler tissue and, and a non-functional tissue is what it's been described in medical journals over the years. But make no mistake about it. This is not a new concept and it's not a new finding. You can trace back for literally three, four hundred years. Um, throughout medical journals that there is discussion and mentioning of fascia. It's just now it's getting to the point where we have the technology and the resources and the the understanding to study it correctly that we're getting a better idea of what it really is. So now bringing this down for the strength and conditioning crowd specifically, what you what you should understand about the fascial system is this. A, it is a significant component to to physiological function anatomical structure and human movement and performance. We don't know just yet definitively how much influence it has on these different things, but it is 100% a factor to be considered. The biggest thing with the fascial system is it is highly, highly enriched with free nerve endings, proprioceptive bodies, nociceptive bodies, and essentially mechanoreceptors. So think about this no differently than the way that cars are now. Right. We have all of these different sensors around our, our, our frame. We have them in the tires, in the engine, all these different things. These sensors are constantly on waiting for things to alert them. When we get those alerts, it prompts a signal on our dashboard. And then there's either a user or a car response from there. That is very similar to how the fascial tissue works. Let's take foam rolling, for example. Very easy one that people love to talk about. Well, they have been studying foam rolling so heavily for the last 15 years or so and the, and the majority of them are looking at things that are just not conducive to the mechanics of foam rolling foam rolling is not going to lengthen tissue not what it's designed to do it's not going to necessarily make you less sore or more flexible however foam rolling is essentially just in a, a, a mechanotransductive endeavor in that we are providing a bio mechanical stimulus that creates a biochemical cascade. So in other words, we put this object on our hamstring, the mechanoreceptors in the hamstring detect that sense of touch or pressure that triggers a response, which then changes the chemical environment in that area. So it plays on the neurology. It's, it's dampening or, or desensitizing, you know, uh, nociceptive responses that induce pain. So when you come in and you have sore hamstrings, you roll on the foam or you get up, you feel less sore. That is a mechanotransductive response. It's not decreasing your pain. It's not decreasing the soreness, soreness. It's decreasing or impairing the sensation of it, which is then also indirectly changing the GTO muscle spindle relationship, which allows us to get deeper into a stretch. So it will transiently improve the opportunity for flexibility. So for, again, the, the stake of the strength and conditioning coaches understand that there is a, a very, very important priority on the sensory motor and proprioceptive function that goes well beyond the foam rolling example. That's just an easy way to make it. And in terms of the strength side of things, think about it like this. We are seeing a continued linear rise in non-contact soft tissue injuries from 2010 to 2020. Why is that? We have more technology, more tracking, more software, more open source information than ever before. But we are seeing a continued rise in non-contact soft tissue injury. Now, this is obviously multivariant. We can talk about this literally for hours and hours on end. But think of it like this. 
if if the if an ACL tear was a force deficit problem, we would train every athlete like a powerlifter, and we would never see a non-contact soft tissue injury. To add to the riddle, how many times have we seen a running back who can back squat 700 pounds, but then go out and tear his ACL after he does a single leg jump and lands funny on on his on his left foot, right? So what that really put into perspective for me was what we're doing is not wrong, but it is incomplete. And we need to figure out what that incomplete aspect of it is, because there is no reasonable sense as to why we should be seeing soft tissue injuries the way that we are with the accessibility, the resources and the tools that we have. And I believe personally, and I think that I have a good body of evidence of this, that a big part of our problem is that we have been overemphasizing the contractile tissue capacity and not giving enough attention to the connective tissue resiliency. And that is where the fascial system comes into play for strength and conditioning. So just repeat that last sentence. I think that the we have been overzealous to the contractile tissue capacity and not putting enough attention on the connective tissue resiliency. And that is, in a sense, where the fascial system comes into fruition for for the strength and conditioning community, is that we have to understand beyond just force production. Great. So how do we think of this, uh, you know, pay attention to the connective tissue resiliency? What can we do? Yeah. So, again, we'll start very simple on this. If we just if you ask the question, how do you optimally train the fascial system? I would give you these bullet points. Number one, global omnidirectional move. Just move in different planes of motion, right? Uh, forwards, backwards, left, right, intersect all those cardinal planes and do them in different movement patterns. Number two, uh, wide range of loading spectrum. So, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of quote unquote term, you know, the fascial zone to be kind of that 40 to 80% range where we want to do things with high intent, high velocity. I like throwing in a lot of like oscillatory type of of patterns or movements, um, but really working in that submaximal range, but doing so at very high intent. Use a wide array of load type, get away from the barbell, do barbell work, but landmine work, bed balls, kettlebells, aqua bags, iso inertial resistance, flywheels, do all of it. Train barefoot as often as you can when prudent. I'm a big believer in that. I think that has a tremendous amount of, of benefit for people. Um, and, and I think, again, it's another one that can be done so easily with, with you know, really no change in anybody's setting or structure. And then the last one is work proximally to distally. You know, so almost everything that we do should be, you know, perceived from the core outward. So, and when we say core, hips, pelvis, trunk, you know, lats, inner back muscles, outward. Um, but you know, we need to have that, that proximal stiffness for our, our distal speed and our distal mobility. And then I, I'm sorry, one last one is mostly unilateral or contralateral based movement. So again, we're breaking down, breaking away from the compound constrained bilateral setting. Um, you know, I think at most in any given session, I'll have one exercise that's back squat, hex bar, pull, you know, and then after that, we're going to kind of break away from it. Interesting. So. It doesn't. I think you even said this in an article. Like, because you 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 had a, a good graph of of kind of what you should do. It doesn't seem like anything groundbreaking, right? Oh. But it's putting it in. It's kind of getting away from, I guess, the dogmatic stuff of, hey, we we have to do these things, and then this becomes second thought. Would you agree? Yeah, well, here's another good way to look at it too, right? If we look back all the way to the origins of strength and conditioning in the 50s and the 60s and Boyd Epley and everyone that that kind of galvanized, organized strength and conditioning, what were their major influences? Well, it was Soviet training, it was bodybuilders, it was powerlifters, and it was Olympic weightlifters. And, and really, it was, you know, all of these things that were just physique and weightlifting specific driven, right? So what I think the bench, the back squat, and and the deadlift are are the the ways that we have developed, uh, the best ways that we have developed to just apply a shit ton of force to people in a reasonably safe manner, right? But those movements 
were not necessarily intended or initially designed for the sake of sport performance. We just found those as being good for a force application. Then we take it a step further. What are our common accessories? Dumbbell row, dumbbell bench press, RDL, push press, good morning, all things that are designed to improve those big movements, the bench, the squat, the dead, the clean, the jerk, right? So we have this, this catalog or this, this uh, you know program approach that is designed for weightlifting, bodybuilding, and Olympic weightlifting. And I think, again, there are components of that that are really good for sports performance. But beyond that, I don't know. So I think, it's, and we go back to what we started with on our time efficiency, right? If I have three hours to program for somebody in a given week, I just have a really hard time finding value on a dumbbell RDL, a barbell bent row, a dumbbell bench press. The redundant accessories to me just really don't seem to have a lot of value irrespective of age, endeavor, whatever, right? We're going to find other things that are going to give you a higher return on investment. And like you said, it's not a matter of doing different things. It's just a matter of doing some things differently. So we take that dumbbell bilateral RDL, and now we're just going to take it. Uh, we're going to do it as a single arm, single leg kettlebell crossover, and we're going to pause it below the knee. Still an RDL, but now we're getting hip internal external rotation management. We're getting pronation, supination, controlling at the foot. We're getting cross-body reaching that's engaging more of the lateral line and posterior sling. So for me, rather than trying to bump somebody up five or 10 pounds every week for six weeks on a dumbbell RDL for six, eight, 10 reps, I want to do tempo applications, different vectors, change the load implement, and still do those same basic mechanics. Yeah. Do you think part of it too is some people, and you, I think you mentioned a little bit of this too, is uh, not making this like a circus act, right? Oh, so yeah. uh, that that's the, the the danger in the thought process here. Yeah, man. And I really hate when I see people that that try to try to capture the the fascia thing, and then you you see them doing towel crunches, or they've got bat wings on, standing on a bosu ball, and and juggling. I mean. It just is ridiculous. And, and like we kind of talked about in our prelude here, it's almost to me as if the, the fascia buzzword is kind of becoming functional training 2.0. And, and that scares me a little bit because we need to understand this. We don't need to brand it. And the understanding piece is, is really going back to the training parameters or how we are doing things, not what we are doing. If I do a bilateral RDL with dumbbells, and I do them with an eccentric overload and a five pound overload each week. I'm doing those for the sake of improving eccentric stretch tolerance for the hamstring. But if I do them with different implements, I do them with pulsing application in the bottom range. I do them with a crossover element. Now I'm not doing an RDL for the sake of doing an RDL. I'm doing it for different elements that are training the foot and hip relationship so that my athlete doesn't have as much of a likelihood of tearing an ACL when they go back out on the field or the court. That, again, is really all that this comes down to is how are we manipulating or modifying exercises or movements to produce more meaningful outcomes for the people that we're working with, no more, no less. Yeah, so if I'm hearing that correctly, it's just like taking some of these exercises and rethinking those, the big the big patterns, almost like I guess Pat Davidson, yeah. that's his, uh, rethinking those ideas and, uh, based on uh, some of the specific we're generalizing when we can we're being specific when we need to right absolutely and 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 just to close that out because that's a good point to finish on is like hey don't don't misconstrue this if i have somebody who cannot perform a good bilateral simple hinge then we obviously aren't progressing it right and that's a thing another thing that i think people kind of lose sight of is like I'm not saying we just skip over these things and do it in a whole bunch of different ways. No, if we can't do something simple, don't add complexity to it. But rather than just seeing the the overload or the simple progressive overload as being the upper echelon of, of progressing strength and conditioning, that to me, I disagree with. We have a lot more that we can sift through and build through that's going to be more valuable or actionable for me um, in, in my setting. Awesome. So let's just finish up with, uh, you You do have a lot of free resources, so people can check those all out at rudrockstrength.com, and I'll have a link to that. But you also have the Fascia Chronicles, which is a course, a full 
10 hours of video and webinar. And there's some CEUs through this as well. So, you know, at least with that, that, that people can justify. I don't know why you shouldn't use CEOs to justify <laughs> getting it, but whatever. Uh, talk to us about, uh, give us an overview of Fascia Chronicles and what I can expect. And kind of, obviously, it's going to go deeper than what we were just talking about. Sure, sure. Um, man, I was I was extremely proud of how that project came together. Um, and that's not something that I say often, but um, this is more than just my, you know, you're, you're going to hear more than just my bullshit and, and opinions on things. Um, my team was was phenomenal top to bottom on this. So Jeremy Aspa, my wife, Nicole, who really put everything together behind the scenes is, is just so incredible. Um, Rob Umfris, who is a true clinical fascial expert, um, you know, had a couple of, of modules on this. So it's a really big project. There's about 12 hours of video content in total. We broke everything up into 20 to 30 minute modules so that people can work their way through this at their own pace. It's an interactive course where we're still kind of adding and shifting a couple of things. There's interactive quizzes, uh, but we work through a really big gamut. So, you know, everything from the conventional, you know, fascial anatomy, physiology, understanding kind of the mechanics and the properties of the tissue to then transitioning into more of like, hey, here's what we need to know is strength and conditioning coaches, practitioners, clinicians, different types of applications and, and, you know, program schematics and things of that nature. Then we'll take a look at like, how is this involved in sport? Because I think that's another priority that a lot of people have had. Um, and I haven't really answered much in a lot of the free re uh, resources, but we did put a good bit of attention to in this is like, what does this mean for a running back? What does this mean for a volleyball player? How do we analyze this and assess this in sports? So we cover that quite a bit. Um, and then my guy, Jeremy, who is uh, an athletic trainer, uh, works with uh, military pilots in, in uh, Virginia. Uh, he broke down a lot of the restorative applications and elements to this, too. So. You know, what happens to the fascial tissue after injury, after surgery? How do we, you know, go from early phase rehab to more of a transitional rehab back into return to play? Uh, so it's got a lot of content in there, uh, some great contributions from the team. And, you know, like I said, man, I think this uh, this actually came together very well. And I'm very appreciative of Simply Faster for all of their help in, in hosting this and the NSCA for, you know, putting their name on this, too. I know that was, uh, you know, that's something that, that was really big for us as well. So. You can access it from our site through rudrockstrength.com, through Simply Faster's site directly. Uh, we'll be posting the link all across social media for the next couple of weeks. So uh, definitely would encourage people to check that out if this is something that is of interest to you. Yeah, and I'll say just from the stuff that I've read and watched, uh, Danny's done a great job just in general of making this. And I, I kind of comparing him earlier, I told him, Todd Wright, what Todd Wright did for the Gary Gray stuff and made it simpler and practical in our setting, uh, I feel like some of the stuff that you're doing is doing that with the anatomy trains and the Thomas Myers stuff. So it's kind of funneling down into this really good uh, practical use of this, of its complicated topic. So, it, man, it, it, I really appreciate that, and 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 it it is it is. <laughs> I, I would just change your terminology from complicated to ambiguous. And there's there's just a lot of stuff that is still yet to be defined, but we're getting there. And and I think, you know, for someone like myself, you know, I'm I'm about 20 IQ points short of of being in a research clinic or a dissection lab full time, but we're getting decent with this application thing. So I just want to continue to play my role in the application side. But there's so much research that's being pushed out. You know, a lot of stuff coming from the Steckos, especially Robert Schleip. Um, all of these people are really starting to get a good understanding of it. But if I can just add one quick thing on there, too, um, you know, the course has been fantastic. We're extremely you know, impressed with everything so far. But we are actually going to be taking this to a workshop setting for 2023. And we're going to be looking at about four cities um, here, at, you know, stateside. Uh, to put on this clinic and basically bring the Fashion Chronicles to life. So we actually have established our first clinic um, is going to be February. Let me make sure I don't mess this up. Uh, February 19th and 20th in Dallas at Basic Methods. Um, and we are going to be 
putting on basically all of these different, you know, protocols, assessment applications, and and trying to do them in a way that is conducive to the population that we're presenting to. So be on the lookout for that. Um, my guy Ryan Basic, who I'm I'm, I'm uh, you know partnering with at Basic Methods, is also going to be doing some presenting at this one. So if you guys haven't you know seen his stuff and what they're doing it uh, out of Basic Methods, man, check that out on Instagram because he's he's got some incredible stuff going as well. So it's good. it's going to be a really good event, and I'm really excited to put this together. Very cool. Will that be uh, really a compliment to this the course and say hey, like it's probably better to do the course then come here right i would look at the the online course is basically being the kind of the overview and kind of the just hey here's every little piece of the the base understanding of the fascial system with the in-person workshops what we're trying to do is answer the specific questions and give the specific details to all of these different contextual environments and settings and really just again addressing it based on what the demand is from what we get as far as input is concerned Cool. And that's going to be two days in Dallas? Big course. Yes, sir. Cool. And then uh, do you know what other three cities you're having? Or Um, It's looking like Miami is going to be one. We're we're thinking probably in in the December timeframe for Maine. I would love to do one in San Diego, LA. So if anybody's out there listening, San Diego, LA, we would love to have a host site out there. And then I'm probably going to make a trip back home, you know, see if we can't put something together in Virginia or, or DC area. Um, you know, we'll see what kind of the demand is. And then we're going to try to do one international conference. So either in Spain or, or UK um, at some point later in the year as well. Very cool. Danny, thanks again for doing this, man. We really appreciate uh, all you've done, all the education you're doing, and I look forward to uh, more coming from you. Anthony, thank you so much for having me, man. I really appreciate it. All right, that's going to do for episode 347 of the Shrank Coach Podcast. You can try the new shrankcoach.com out for seven days for free. Totally new format, user-friendly, same great form as always. It's the place where top coaches in the industry come to connect and learn. Go to shrankcoach.com. Click the Join Now button to get started on your free trial. Thanks to Chris Barrier and the folks over at Perform Better. Don't forget, holiday sale, 40% off racks, benches, bands, sandbags, cleaning supplies, you name it. Also, the one-day seminars are back starting in January. They'll be in New Jersey, Austin, L.A., Chicago, and Boston. Check it all out at performbetter.com. Thanks to Coach Boyle and Danny Foley. Guys, don't forget to check out that anniversary interview I did with Coach Boyle, 40 Mistakes, 40 Years. You can access that at shrinkcoachpodcast.com or continuefit.com. Thanks to Nomly. I am so excited about the new Maximizing the Member Experience segment. Nomly helps you build relationships through personalized communication so your members stay longer and pay longer. Go to Nomly.com. Use the referral code Shrink Coach to get started on your free 30-day trial. Thanks to Vince Gabriel and Kiss Marketing. If you need some help with your marketing, head over to kissmarketing.net to book a free coaching call with Will Matheson, Vince Gabriel's secret marketing weapon. Check it out at kissmarketing.net. Thanks to Nico Ouellette and Perch. Perch is a 3D camera-based weight room technology solution bringing VBT into the 21st century. Head over to perch.fit slash coach to find out more about it. They have some great videos showing the cameras and how to use it. Thanks to Athletic Greens. Visit athleticgreens.com slash coach to get your free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs today. I'm Anthony Rana. Check out the show notes at continuefit.com. That's going to do it for this episode. Thanks again, and I'll speak to you next time.